and I said to my family, I'm done. And she turned to us and said, I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. And I got to a point where I was in a lot of pain. <laughs> usual vlogmas where I'm decorating the Christmas tree or I don't know Christmas shopping or something and the reason for that is because that's really not representative of this time and especially this day for us as a family and those of you that know us personally will know that today is a very special day for us but it's also a really hard time. And, and for those of you that don't know, today is the third anniversary of my first daughter. Today she would have turned three years old. Um, Ren's older sister that passed away shortly before I gave birth. Now this video isn't <laughs> pre-planned, I've not practiced, I have no idea like how it's gonna go so I apologise if it's quite disjointed, I'm just talking from my experience, I'm really talking from the heart and I just wanted to share my story with you guys um, and just give you a little bit of an insight into what happened and how, I guess how it has impacted our daily lives. Um, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of details because it is very personal, it is private and it's not something that I openly talk about to people. So Quinn was my first pregnancy and she was due on the 3rd of December in 2017. So we'd actually gone away for the weekend for my birthday and I felt super tired, I was having to have a nap and I just felt so exhausted. And then I realized and thought, hang on, I think I'm late. <laughs> um, which wasn't unlike me, I was usually like clockwork and I usually um, realized. And I went, we were actually in Oxford. We went to the Boots in Oxford, picked up a test and I did it and found out that I was pregnant. So we, were really excited. I mean, I was a huge bag of emotions. I was scared. I didn't know what to expect, but I was also like super excited. And we went into Thornton's and bought these like chocolate slabs and we had them personalized and had written on them, baby Cadwallader coming in December. Um, we got one for each of our parents and we obviously had the rest of our weekend stay and then we went back home to tell our parents. My pregnancy, I did blog about this at the time, um, it was definitely quite tough. Um, I did suffer from morning sickness pretty much every single day and I, the only way I can describe it, it was like having a constant hangover, being sick, having terrible headaches, feeling exhausted and waking up like with a muzzy head and towards the end I really started to like swell up um, if you look back at the pictures I mean I'll put one up on the screen so you can see just how swollen my feet were um, but if you pressed your finger into my foot it actually like left an indentation of at least an inch in my foot it was that bad and like all my hands would swell up I could I could like struggle to move them um, and they would go like numb and tingling I'd get a lot of dizzy spells and I 
couldn't get like my rings on and off and you could also like see it in my face you could see my face was swollen and my mum actually has a history of preeclampsia she fitted and um, she almost had to have me at 20 weeks because she was so so that was always a concern for me I was always quite worried about that during my pregnancy they were measuring me and they said that I was measuring large for dates and that the baby was quite big and I was quite concerned about this because my mum had had to have us all via c-section because she had a small pelvis and wasn't actually able to give birth to us naturally and my sister actually fractured her pelvis from giving birth to my niece um, who was eight pound four so I was quite concerned and worried that the same would apply to me but I was just told that it's your first child and they just let you have a go <laughs> see how you get on and then they kind of deal with it there and then then I was actually moved to high risk because and put on consultant because I was measuring large for date but they did actually say to me there's nothing they tend to do for larger babies it's the small ones they're worried they're more worried about I expressed my concerns to my midwife um, my community midwife who she was amazing Emma she was really lovely um, and she said you know what I'll book you in for a sweep on your due date but I'll also see if I can get an appointment with the consultant so that you can discuss your concerns with them so she rang up and said I've got an appointment for you on the Friday and I said oh I've <laughs> I'm at a wedding this is the 1st of December um, we had a friend's wedding and uh, she said okay well um, can you do the following day I said yeah fine so we I went the next day with my mum and dad, I think Gavin was at football. I said to them then, um, I was getting slightly reduced movement. She said, well, she had actually pulled up my file early in the day, the consultant wasn't around. She would pulled up my file early in the day, like in the morning and spoken to the consultant about it. And she said that she had just said to induce me. I said okay fine if that's what you think that's absolutely fine um, and she said there's no one at the desk or something on um, because they've closed or something but they'll call me first thing in the morning to book in an induction she tried to do a stretch and a sweep but my cervix or and everything wasn't favorable um, I wasn't like Quinn wasn't even engaged, I wasn't showing any signs of labour, I'd never had Braxton Hicks or any tightenings or anything. So she said I've tried to but I've not really managed to do anything. So um, the following morning I got a phone call saying she had a slot at 12 and 4 o'clock. So I asked for the 4 o'clock one because I was like frantically like nesting and scrubbing the house, making sure it was spotless to make sure that it was perfect for when we got home with the baby and while I was in hospital that there was nothing to be done while I wasn't there. So um, all the bags are packed and everything and I just got my last little bits together and we went to the hospital at four o'clock. I think it might have been like quarter past four, maybe half four. And I was put on the monitor and she was so active, like she was moving around like crazy. And they said they wanted to wait for her to calm down and um, settle down before they gave me the pessary which was the start of the induction process. She gave me the pessary which is like um, I think it's like a hormone or something on a string and that's released over 24 hours and it's supposed to and over the next 24 hours I didn't feel anything I wasn't having any contractions or or anything. The lady opposite me, she had just been examined and they'd agreed to send her up to delivery suite and I was on a ward Um, there weren't any private rooms. They said usually when they induce you they put you in one but I was put on a ward and there was just me and one other lady. She obviously was starting to have contractions so I did not get any sleep that night. I texted a friend she said like ask them to run you a bath so I went for a bath to try and see if that would help me get some sleep and maybe relax me but I was just absolutely knackered so from the Sunday to the Wednesday multiple women were coming in having their gel or having 
the pessary or whatever to start the induction process and they were pretty much starting contractions straight away and they were going up to delivery suite um, and I saw I think about seven of them come in start contractions and go and nothing was happening like I couldn't feel anything and all that ha was happening was I was exhausted from no sleep and I was just so fed up. I wasn't sleeping because obviously these women were having gas and air and crying out in pain from their contractions and I was just exhausted. So by the Wednesday morning, I was very, very emotional. Um, I was fed up. I felt like I wasn't being listened to or taken seriously. And I'd ha actually packed my bags and had them ready to go. And I said to my family, I'm done. I, I'm, I'm going home it's not working, they're not listening to me, and I've had enough. I said, I'm going, I'm going to go home, there's no point in me being here. At this point, broke down to the midwife and just said, I've had enough. Because she actually made a bit of a sarky comment to me, because um, I hadn't eaten my breakfast. On the Monday, they'd mentioned a C-section, because they noted that things weren't happening. So I didn't eat my breakfast, thinking, just in case. Um, and the midwife came around and said, you won't be having a C-section. They'll probably just start the process again. I just burst into tears. So the consultant came around, she examined me and she said, oh fine, we can break your water. She proceeded to push down on my stomach. She said, how are you with examinations? Do you need gas and air? Are you gonna be okay? And I said, yeah, fine. And she pushed down on my stomach really hard and she said, I'm just trying to push the baby down onto your cervix, cervix to see if I can feel the baby's head on your cervix. And she said, like, well done you, like really good job like with going through that. Um, we'll find out a time of when we can take you up to delivery and we've just got to wait for you to go up. They came back with three o'clock and we actually made a bit of a joke because at so many points through my time in there, we were told things would be happening and they didn't happen. So we actually made a joke and said, oh, it'll be tomorrow or maybe the day after. Um, and then it got to nine, half nine, and she came to just do some checks. So she took a Doppler, like the little handheld device that they put on your tummy, and she put it on the right side of my tummy, the middle and the left. And I said to her, that doesn't sound right. That sounds quite faint. And she said, oh no, it's just an old machine. She said, no, baby sounds really happy in there. There's nothing else I need to do with you now. It's just a case of waiting for them to call you up. I lay down in bed and I remember I was lying on my left side and um, I felt her, it was half 11, because so, I looked at the time, and I felt her kick, like push her foot out twice, like two firm pushes. And I just rubbed my tummy and said, it's okay, baby, we're going home soon. Like, it's okay. Um, we're going home. I just lay there and all these women were like screaming around me and I thought there's no way I'm gonna get any sleep but I really need to try because I'm gonna be exhausted. I just lay there and then they came around and said we're ready for you. So I picked up my phone I was like it's dead on midnight. So I phoned Gavin and I said um, they're just taking me up now just get yourself dressed ready and come. So he was on his way and I picked up my bags and the lady who was gonna be my midwife for delivery took me up in the lift and she she turned to me and she said, how how do you feel? And I said, I've waited so long for this. Like, I'm so, so excited. Like, I've waited so long. I can't believe it's finally happening. So um, she took me to the delivery room. I got on the bed, she said, um, don't worry, we won't break your waters or anything till your husband's here, but I've just got a couple of checks to do first. So she asked me to do a urine sample, which I did, and then I lay on the bed and she went to put the monitor on, you know, the one with the, if, if you've had a baby, it's the one with the bands with the, like, disc. So she put that on my stomach and she couldn't find anything. And she moved it a couple of like in a couple of places around my stomach and there was just nothing and then she got i think they're called a tourniquet the like horn thing and put that on my stomach and was moving around and listening and i could tell i knew from her face that something was wrong i knew i knew then so she said i don't want to keep doing this and worrying you 
so I'm just gonna go next door, speak to a doctor and we're gonna do a scan. So at this point Gavin got here and I said they can't find a heartbeat and he said it's fine. Like they, they keep saying it's an awkward baby, they keep saying it's a boy. And he said like if there was anything wrong they'd be rushing round. If it was serious, if there was something wrong, they would be rushing round and trying to find out or doing something. We, I text my mum to say we can't find a heartbeat. And then we got up and we had to walk into another room. Um, Gavin was next to me, I lay on the bed. And then there's a doctor who did a scan. She put, it was an ultrasound scan. She put the device onto my stomach and up on the screen you could see black, you could see her spine and you could just see nothing. No heartbeat. And she, and she turned to us and said, I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. At this point, Gavin dropped to his knees in tears, the midwife started crying and I, I was just in shock. I just didn't react. I thought they've, they've got it wrong. And I just said, I looked at her and I just said, thank you. So I just stood up and I walked to the room next door and I phoned my mum and said, mum, we've lost the baby. And she just broke down into tears and they said they were on their way. Gavin called his parents too and they came over. Then came in to tell us that they needed to dot the I's and cross the T's as they said. And they said they needed to do another scan. Um, so the same doctor came in to do the scan and another consultant came in to confirm there's no heartbeat. And he said, listen, we'll get you the best pain relief we'll, um, and we'll come up with a plan. He said, I have the choice of whether I want to wait and let things start naturally, or I can start the induction process straight away. And I said, I want to start the induction process straight away. At this point, we were moved to a bigger room, like twice the size, and we are also given the room next door for the family. They started the induction process. I was given a drip and I was given an epidural and it was just a case of waiting. They said it could be hours. I remember being so, so cold. I was like shivering and everyone like lay their coats on me because I was so cold and we waited and waited and the hours went by. I was just fed up. I just wanted to go home. I said, I just want to go home. I just want to get this done and I need to go home. And I was so, so tired. I was like, can you not just give me a C-section? Can you not just get this done? And they said, no, you've just got to wait. Hours went by and I got to a point where I was in a lot of pain. And I started feeling really bad pain on top of the epidural. And I was in a lot of pain and I was hanging on to Gavin and shaking. Our midwife had disappeared off behind a death. It was actually just me and Gavin in the room. And I was really, really struggling. And I was like clinging on to him and shaking. And my dad walked in and he took one look at me and said that's not right so he walked out and he went to get my mum and he said you better get in there so she came in and she looked at my blood pressure and she said we need to get someone in here gavin and her like i don't remember at this point i'm just going off what they've said um because i started to lose consciousness they were just counting my blood pressure going up and up so she ran to go and get the midwife who was actually just sat behind the desk we know now the reason that she was going um behind the desk was she was going to her colleagues for support because she had never delivered a stillborn baby but she came back in um and my blood pressure had got up to I think it was 145, 149 over 165. They 
rushed to the anaesthetist and they got me a paracetamol drip and slowly I like started to come round. Um, and then the midwife said to me, oh, was it pressure you were feeling? And I was like, no, that was not pressure. I was in a lot of pain. And I was just so scared. They're asking me loads of questions. They're asking me what I wanted to happen after I gave birth. And I was just so scared. I didn't know what to say. I feel so guilty saying this now, but at the time, I was just cutting myself off emotionally from it all. I thought I could just cut myself off. I thought if I didn't process any of this, I just got it done, went home. I could just pretend it never happened and cut it off. And just, I was trying to protect myself because I thought I can't deal with this. And I said, I don't want to hold her. I don't want to see her. I just want to go home. But Gavin really wanted to hold her. And I was just so scared. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what she was gonna look like. I'd never seen a dead baby before. Um, I was terrified. My poor mum, I kept looking to her for support and I kept asking her like, what's gonna happen? And she just didn't know what to say because she didn't know either. And looking back, I could have really done with someone there to support me. Someone to let me know that it was gonna be okay because I was so scared. A few more hours went by and by this time, it was Thursday afternoon on the 7th. And we got to two o'clock and they examined me and said, we'll leave you for an hour and then you can start pushing. So at three o'clock, I started pushing. And then I turned to the midwife and said, this is pressure. I can feel the pressure now. At quarter past four, I gave birth to her. At this point, my mum said, she's beautiful. And she stepped out of the room because she wanted to give me and Gavin some time together. So Gavin was holding her in his arms. And then his family came in and they held her. And then my family came in and they held her and I still I hadn't held her. I was the last person to hold her. I didn't want to hold her while everyone was around. I wanted my own space. I wanted my own time. I've actually skipped out a huge bit. So after I gave birth, I obviously had to deliver the placenta and they gave me the injection and everything. And the midwife was like tugging on the cord and nothing was happening. Then all of a sudden <clears throat> um, the placenta was delivered and she started like massaging my stomach and she turned to Gavin and said, I'm just gonna press the buzzer. I've asked for help, but no one's come. Uh, but you're just having a little bleed and I just need some support. So she pressed the buzzer and a million people come running in. They put the bed right back and I don't really know what they're doing. The doctor, he was just like asking me if I was okay and just like talking to me and then seemed to get it all under control. Um, my mum said that she was really alarmed and really scared because all these people were running in and the lady said to her that it's not a med medical emergency to go back in her room. Gavin was terrified. He thought that he was losing me. Obviously I couldn't see what was going on. I just was kind of lay there. I didn't know what was happening. But it wasn't until the night shift when another midwife came on that she actually told me that I'd lost a lot of blood because I was saying that I wanted to go home and she said I'd rather you stay over because you've lost a lot of blood um, and I had no idea um, that I actually had a postpartum hemorrhage um, but I had no idea. We stayed there overnight. We had a little cot next to the bed. A few midwives actually took her away and bathed her. Then like we dressed her and then I like cuddled her and they took some pictures, which at the time we, I did feel a bit uncomfortable and I was unsure and I thought, I don't think I want these. But looking back, I'm really glad I did. And I would say for anyone that has gone through the same thing like take your time and do have those pictures because it's one of the only things that you have to remember so i had her in bed with me and i was just like cuddling up to her i barely slept that night i was worried about gavin to be honest he had a shower and he was just like 
screaming out in pain and I just felt so protective over him and I was so worried about him so we stayed overnight and the following morning we cuddled her <laughs> even more they did like handprints and footprints for us and they took some of her hair and put it in a box for us we were actually given a box which is donated to a lot of the hospitals and it was from a charity called for Lewis and I just want to say a huge thank you to that charity because if it wasn't for them we wouldn't have those things today to remember her by so then the bereavement midwife came in and we had to go through what we wanted to do in terms of the post-mortem and everything and we decided to go for a full post-mortem because we wanted to know what had happened. She went and she was examined by the doctor and they confirmed there was nothing physically they could see. The cord wasn't around her neck or anything when she was born. She was going to have a full post-mortem and we also had to go through the process of like what we had to do to register and everything. Um, and they also asked us whether we wanted to leave her and leave her in the room or whether they wanted or, or whether they wanted them to take her away first and we decided we couldn't bear to leave her in the room and walk away so we asked them to take her first so the midwife turned around and said i'll just check if the coast is clear because obviously anyone that's just had their baby doesn't want to see a baby that's died being taken down the corridor. I understand that. But it was just so heartbreaking to hear because she was so beautiful. She truly was an angel. Oh, sorry. So it was snowing really, really bad that day. Like it just snowed and snowed and we got in the car and got home. And my parents had been over and they'd moved everything. So all the high chairs and everything that we had out in the house, they'd all moved into the nursery room and shut the door. They just weren't sure whether we wanted to see it or not. And I hadn't had a shower or baths or anything at this point because I just felt so weak, emotionally and physically. And I got in the bath and I just remember breaking down to my mum and saying, I can't do this. I really can't. And I can't explain to you the feeling of going into hospital. Even when we're finally being called up to delivery, thinking finally we're getting to bring our baby home and then coming home empty handed. It's been three years. It hasn't got any easier. A lot of you may look and think, oh, but you've got a beautiful daughter now. But that doesn't replace Quinn. I remember a friend's mum actually saying to us at the time that she turned around and said, it's okay, you'll have another. And it wasn't about replacing her. She will never be replaced. And I think one of the hardest things is sometimes dealing with a lot of ignorance. And I'm not, I'm not kind of like shaming and finger pointing I, I don't think you truly understand until you have been through something yourself I mean before it had ever happened to me I always thought that's such a horrible thing but until you go through it I mean I always said when anyone that's a parent or a mum you can get some kind of understanding because you know what it's like to be pregnant and to have a child as well I get so many people turn to me and say I don't know how you do it, you're so strong. But I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. It's such a crap club to be a part of. I didn't ask for this and I definitely did not want this, but I have no choice. There are days when I feel like I can't do it anymore, um, I'll be honest. And there are days I feel like I can't go on and I feel like oh, I just want to be with her. And not only that, it does feel very isolating. I dread people asking me, she your first when they see Ren or how many kids have you got? Because it's a toss up of whether I lie and then I feel guilty on myself that I've lied and I'm just kind of forgetting this whole part of my life or I'm 
honest and I make them feel awkward and uncomfortable for asking and it's a toss up. Do I have to feel guilty? But why should I feel guilty? Why shouldn't I talk about it? Why shouldn't I say something? But then on the other hand, I don't want to make people feel uncomfortable and I don't want to make them feel guilty for asking. And I think because of that, I have felt very isolated and it does feel very lonely. For example, we've now moved to Jersey and I've never been to a parent and toddler club. My pregnancy with Ren, I never went to the, the antenatal classes because I just didn't want to face it and I didn't want to face people asking questions. So now I don't, <laughs> I take Ren to a dance class which she started um, in September but apart from that we very rarely go out and we don't really socialise much with other people and I do feel really guilty, I feel like it's not just had an impact on me and Gavin, I feel like it's also had an impact on Ren and I do feel really guilty for that and the reason I wanted to make this video today is I know it's very sensitive, I know a lot of you will be wondering why I've done this um, but the reason I wanted to do this is I wanted to tell our story, I wanted to share our experience but I'm also aware that in the current circumstances of everything going on right now this is still happening. People are still having to go through this every day but they can't have their family, they can't see them and they can't have that support. The reason I want to make this video is to share my experiences and just to let those people know that they're not alone in this and and just to let them know that it's okay not to be okay 